So I would like uh, to introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Manghang Sha. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sha is a group leader here at NCATS. Uh, she leads the systems toxicology group. And uh, she will be talking today to us about in vitro toxicological testing using a QHTS platform. Uh, Meghank, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Siri, for a very nice introduction. So my presentation today, I will uh, cover some key elements of the high throughput screening that uh, can be used for the toxicological studies. So first, I will uh, introduce you the Tox21 program um, and talk about uh, how we apply the high throughput screening technology um, for toxicological testing, including assay selection, assay design, compound library, and data analysis. And then I will give you one example of how we perform the high throughput screening for the Tox21 program. So we all know um, currently we are- Meg Hong, this is yes. Mike. There's a gray box on the right-hand side of your screen. Can you move that box to the next screen? It's uh, overlapping. Yeah, it's lo it's uh, covering one of your slides. Oh, oh, oh. Can I move it like that? Uh, can you close it, X out of it? There you go. Yeah. Can you there see you it? Go. Yes, okay. we can. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so we all know we are living in the environment uh, with numerous chemical compounds that interfere with our daily life. And uh, so far, there are more than 80,000 chemical compounds which are treated for use in the United States. And every year, about 2,000 newly synthesized chemical compounds are introduced into our environment. So the challenge is there are too many environmental chemical compounds with little data available on toxicity. The traditional way to assess the compound toxicity mainly relies on the in vivo animal models. And we know the animal models are not only expensive, low throughput, but also sometimes they failed to predict human toxicity. In order to reduce the animal use for the toxicological testing, and also to advance in vitro toxicological testing in the first is the 21st century. So the U.S. government um, formed a Tox21 collaboration. So this Tox21 program is a multi-government agency collaborative effort among the EPA, FDA, NTP, and NCATS. The mission for this program is to shift the future toxicity testing on traditional animal studies to less expensive and higher throughput in vitro methods. So these in vitro methods are based on the target test with specificity, mechanism driven and biological observations. So in order to achieve um, this mission, we use uh, as a toxicity program, we use a, a battery of the uh, in vitro assays to screening hundreds and thousands of environmental chemical compounds. The data generated from this type of the primary screening can be used to identify the mechanism of the compound action, to prioritize the compound, which identified from the um, primary screening for further in-depth toxicological evaluation. And we also can use this uh, toxin one screening data to develop the uh, computational model to predict the effects of the unknown compounds. So how we do the screening? Okay, so our TOX21 um, screening process started with the, um, the assay nomination. So the assay can be nominated um, by any scientist in the world and will be evaluated by the assay uh, evaluation group within the TOX21 program. So in order to evaluate the assays, so we use two criteria. The first one is if this assay has a toxicological relevance, and the second one, if this assay can be adapted 
into the high throughput screening platform. So if this assay meets these two criteria, it most likely will be approved by the assay evaluation group and the TOX21 leadership. So in order to generate high quality and reproducible data, it is very important to optimize and validate the assay before you run the screening. So before we run the entire TOX21 10,000 compound collection, we always, always run the online validation first to check if the assay uh, performs well in the robotic system. So after the online validation, then we will run the online uh, screening against the, the TOX21 10,000 compound collection. The screening data from this primary screening will be first processed uh, within the NCATS in the informatics team, and then share with share the data with our TOX21 partners, FDA, NTP, EPA. So after about six months to one year, all the data will be published in the database, public database, such as the uh, PubChem. And our TOX21 program also has our own robotic system. So in the NCATS, we have uh, um, several lo robotic systems. And uh, the TOX21 robot is one of them. And we, in our way, it's, it's much smaller than the uh, big robot in the NCATS. So this robot um, is currently located at the NCATS, of course, right, in the Rockview, Maryland. So, we use this robotic system to run all the TOX21 screening. This robot system contains four components I listed in these slides. So the first component is the assay uh, incubator here, show here, and also um, the compound storage. The second component is the liquid handling system. So in our robot, we have a pin tool station, and by Raptor. Um, then also this uh, liquid handlers can transfer the reagents in nanoliter to microliter to the assay plates. The third component is the uh, plate detection system. Just look at the plate signal. So in this, in our robot, we have a Vulux list here and the Invision plate reader. And we also have the um, FDSS kinetic reader, and we can read every second, you know, the reaction. And we also have the, um, the high content imaging operator in this um, robot system. The fourth component is the robotic arm here, and with the uh, software controller system to connect all the components to learn the screen. So we have the robot, and the next one we, you know, we also have our own compound collection because of the NCATS we have a huge collection, maybe like 0.4 million comp compounds, and our tox new one we have uh, 10,000 compounds. So th these compounds are most are the industry chemical compounds, pesticides, food additive. And, uh, and clinical approved drugs. I also listed the other um, compounds here. So this collection uh, was provided by EPA, NTP, and NCATS. So EPA contributed one third of the compounds that also include the compounds from the ToxCast phase one and the phase two program. And NTP provided another uh, one third of the compounds and the NCATS provided the last one set of compounds. The compounds provided by NCATS are mostly FDA approved drugs. So to ensure the screening perform well, we also build in 88 duplicates in each compound plate and made three sets of these 10,000 compounds. So that means every compound, each compound has three copies. And each copy of this particular compound will be plated in a different plate location. 
So the purpose for doing that is to uh, evaluate the screening performance and to make sure the screening performed well. So in order to make sure the compounds we tested are the correct ones, right? So we also um, did the compound quality control testing for our entire library. So all the QC data of these compounds are available in the public database, such as PubChem. So when you click you know, the compound link in the PubChem website, so you, you can see the analytical chromatograph, including percentage purity of these compounds. So as the um, part of the Tox21 program, we have developed the uh, quantitative high throughput screening method for the primary screening. So that means each compound, all the compounds, um, and we will screen them at multiple concentrations. So for the TOX21 program, uh, we use the 15 concentrations that cover over four logs of a concentration range. So the big advantage of this quantitative high throughput screening is that we can review the potency and efficacies of each compound immediately after the project screening. So this method greatly reduces the, uh, the false positive rate and the false negative rate. Um, so, in this way, we also, you know, uh, for this uh, screening, uh, we also, you know, use the 1536 well plate format to do the um, to do the compound screening. So, in this way, we can greatly uh, increase the screening throughput from one month if you use 96 well plates to seven days if we, we use the 1536 well plates to screen one million samples. Therefore, you know, we can see our screening throughput is pretty high. So the next question is how we select the, uh, the assays for screening. As I already mentioned, we, we select uh, assays based on the toxicological relevance and the adaptability to the high throughput screening. And for the assay readouts in the previous um, several speakers also mentioned, um, you know, for us, we commonly use the um, fluorescence, luminescence, and absorbance. And we don't use the radioisotope because it is easy to get radioisotope contamination in the open area for the robotic screen. And we also use the uh, cell lines, stable transfected cell lines, because they're easy to use. However, sometimes those type of the cells may not represent the real physiological conditions. And we also uh, make sure all the cell lines or cell types match their name, match their identity. So we often check the cell identity by using the STR analysis. And this slide show you the, um, the assay requirements of the screening. So for the plate map, we usually uh, use the 1536 well plate and a four to six microliter of the assay volume. For the assay duration, less than 24 uh, hour incubation time is ideal. And we also um, prefer um, the uh, addition only protocol. So that means we just add the cells, regions, and we read. And um, there are no watch step involved. And for the cell-based assay, um, we also test the DMSO tolerance. Uh, so for the tox one screening, uh, the final DMSO concentration in the each well is about 0.5%. So, then another um, three parameters I list here also to use to evaluate the assays. For example, like the signal to background ratio, CV is the coefficient of the vari variation across DMSO plates should be uh, less than 10% and the Z factor should be more than 0.5. And another important requirement is the potency variation for the positive controls in the assay plates. 
day-to-day -day, uh, variation of the IC50s or EC50s value for the positive control uh, should be less than three to five fold. And we also uh, make sure the cells we use in the screening are the mycoplasma group. Okay, so for the um, tox 21 screening, we validated a group of the cell-based assays. I summarized them into five different areas. The first one is the endocrine the disruption area. About 49 of the assays we run for the tox 21 screening are the nuclear receptors assay. I list here some of the assays. And the second one is the uh, stress response pathways assays. And um, we in I include here uh, several signaling transduction pathway, and I also put the mitochondrial magnetic potential assays here. And the third area is the developmental pathways assay, and the fourth one is the uh, GPCR area, uh, such as the, we use the TSHR and the TRHR. And recently, we have developed the um, gonotrophy release hormone re receptor assays by using, you know, by measuring the uh, calcium influx. And the fifth one is like the mi mi mislinear area, you know, including epigenetics, acetylcholine, and others. So now I will um, present one case study to you and show you how we run the screening for the TOX21 program. So in this project, we used a cell-based mitochondrial membrane potential assay to screening and identify the compounds that decrease mitochondrial membrane potential. So the mitochondrial membrane potential assay is one of the most widely used assay to assess the mitochondria toxicity. So we use the, uh, the assay is very simple. We use the uh, metal MPS dye, which is the lipophilic cation dye for this assay. So in the healthy condition, the cells are polarized and the metal MPS dye accumulated in the mitochondria showing as the aggregates showing the uh, red fluorescence. So after the cells were treated with mitochondria toxins, in this case, uh, the FCCP, so metal MPS dye remains in the cytoplasm as the monomer, which is showing the gray fluorescence. So we use, we use the ratio metric readouts of these two channels, uh, red over the green, fluorescence uh, intensity to assess the mitochondria membrane potential. And this assay can be measured by the plate reader, such as the invasion plate reader, or high content imager, uh, such as the imaging express micro. And we found that there are not much difference of the data measured in either um, using the plate reader or by using the high content imager. Since the reading speed for the plate reader is much, much faster than the imaging um, reader. So there we decide we just use the plate reader for our primary screening. So in order to generate the high quality and the reproducible data from the screening, so that assay development, assay optimization, and the validation are very critical steps in the high throughput screening field. So for the assay development, for the assay optimization part, we often test the uh, cell density per well, positive control, time cost, and the FBS concentrations. So that is very important because uh, when we culture cells, we use 10% serum. But when you do the assay, Sometimes if you do, do very high, you know, concentrate like 10% serum, then you will, sometimes you will get a very small signal to background ratio. And sometimes your compound will be a uh, light shift because the compound binding to the protein. And also the DMSO tolerance is especially important in the cell-based assay. And also you need to test the regime stability because when we run this uh, screening, 
we probably we will run like overnight, maybe like 10 hours, 20 hours. So we want to make sure the reagents, if you stay in the room temperature, they are stable, or you should put it in the ice. So for the assay performance, I already mentioned that we commonly use like three parameters, signal to bell ratio, CVs, and the Z factor. So Z factor basically is combine the signal to bell ratio and the CVs. And also we will look for the, uh, the positive control because we put a positive control for each plate that you will see the IC50s uh, changes with the plates. So this um, slide show you the protocol of the cell-based mitochondrial membrane potential assay. So basically, we, um, the assay is very straightforward and it's also very simple. It's very fit for the high throughput screening platform. So we add 2,000 uh, HEPG2 cells um, per well into the 1536 well plate um, with the final assay volume of the five microliter. And after we incubate the assay plate overnight at 37 degree, we add 23 nanoliter of the compounds and the positive controls into the wells and it continue incubate the assay plates for maybe like one hour. So after the compound treatment, we add a five microliter of the metal and PS dye into the each well and incubate the plate, uh, the assay plates for addition 30 minutes. And then we use the emission plate reader to measure um, green and red fluorescence in, in intensity. And for the compound screening, we always and always in, include the, comp, uh, the, you know, the, the controls for every single plate. So we can use this, um, the control, you know, the, the plate to evaluate the screen performance. So in the 5036 well, we leave the first four columns as the controls. So for example, in the first column, we always put the positive control dose titration. So in this case, it's FCCP uh, dose titration. Column two and column three, uh, there are several concentrations of the FCCP, which can give you the maximum inhibition because sometimes, uh, sometimes we're not sure you know, this concentration is better. So we just put several. Then when you do the data analysis, you can pick the the highest one to get the, uh, the ma maximum inhibition. And the column four is the DMSO negative control. And the column five, the column uh, 48 are the positive control. So for the data analysis for um, the mitochondrial membrane potential assay, um, we use the um, DMSO wells and FCCP wells to normalize our data. So DMSO basically is like, um, 100% and the FCCP is the zero, zero percent. So before you run the, uh, before we run the, uh, the screening, we always um, perform the, the DMSO CV plates across the plate, across the well to evaluate, to validate the assays. So in this mitochondrial membrane potential uh, assay, for the CV plates, we just treat the compounds with either um, positive control like FCCP or with DMSO for one hour and five hours. So we also like, you know, doing like the, the time course. So, so in this case, I think in the previous slides, I already show you the plate map. So you can see here, so this is the actual data. So, so you can see here, the first column is the dose titration of the FCCP. The uh, second and the third is the several concentrations of the FCCP. And uh, column four to column 48, we add the DMSO control. So for our, you know, running this CV plates, we can calculate the CVs, Z factor, and the signal back ratio. So the data I listed in this table, um, you know, su suggests that this assay is a very robust. Um, because, you know, the CVs, it's uh, less than 10%, it's like seven or six, and the Z factor is about 0.7, and the signal band ratio is about, about like 16 fold. So, so this data, um, we are 
we are thinking it's ready for the screening. Since we also did a one hour and five hours uh, treatment, and we don't find much difference, so then we just go with the one hour for the, uh, the primary screening. So after the screening, we will get tons of the data, including the actives and the inactives, and many um, those titration curves. In order to quickly evaluate the uh, screening data, our informatics scientists developed a curve class system. So show in this slides, they um, group them in curve class one, two, three, and four. So particularly, 1.1 uh, is the best curve class with the four um, efficacy. And 1.2 is also pretty good, but it's with the partial efficacy. And curve class three is a single point activity curve and curve class four is inactive. So we can use this curve class system um, to select the compounds. So commonly, um, the, the compounds, if it's with the curve class 1.1, 1.2, 2.1, 2.2, 2, we feel those compounds are you know, with um, better, with a higher rate to be confirmed when you run the, the follow-up study. So however, for the um, tox 21 screening, so I mentioned before we run each compound three times. So sometimes you're lucky, you just got one compound with three uh, same curve class number, like or maybe 1.1, or maybe you know, 1.2. But some of the compounds in this case listed in this table for this particular compound show you very different curve classes. So, so we cannot average that, right? So, so in order to give each compound one numerical measure, so our informatics scientists developed another system called the curve ranking uh, system. So this curve ranking system basically is uh, combine the curve class I just mentioned in the previous slide uh, with the efficacy um, cutoff and combine these two, um, two data converted to the, um, the numerical you know, number. So to the, like we call the curve ranking. So the highest number means the high quality uh, curve class. So, so basically the curve ranking, um, you know, if, if you will see the compounds, they fall in like a five, five to nine, you know, the curve ranking number. So that means these are true agonists. So if, if the compound fall in the um, four to one, they are inconclusive. So if they become like a zero, means inactive. So for the antagonist mode, we just use the minus. Um, so the same thing here, the minus means is the antagonist mode. Positive is agonist mode. So the same thing here, if it's minus eight to minus five, so that is a true antagonist. Um, so then if minus two to minus four, they are the, um, uh, the you know, the in inconclusive. So this system can help us quickly and efficiently identify and select the compounds we want for the follow-up study. And also um, before the, um, the real screening, we always run the online validation first. So we use a very smaller uh, compound collection. So in this case, we use the low, uh, low pack library plus 88 tox 21 compounds. And, and we run this um, library um, three times at seven concentrations. So after the um, online validation, we commonly looking at two things. The first one is a general statistics, just like CV, Z factor, and single band. And the second one, since we did three times, so we can calculate the reproducibility. So in this mitochondrial membrane potential um, screening, uh, these statistical uh, parameters are pretty good, show in this um, table. And, and also for the um, assay reproducibility, um, 
it's also shown in the, in this table on the uh, on the right. So, so the, the the detailed data for the reproducibility of the online validation and the online screening uh, listed here. So you will see the reproducible um, reproducible actually is pretty good um, for the uh, online validation against the low pack. Uh, and the online screening against 10K collection. So the mismatch rate we will see, the mismatch rate means uh, like three copies you will do, three times you will do, maybe one is inactive or maybe two is inactive, the other one is active. So they're totally different. So that means it's the mismatch. Um, so the mismatch rate for both online validation and online screening, they're pretty low. So we are very pleased that this uh, online you know, screening data. So the next step is doing the data analysis. So for the TOX2110 k collection, tensile compounds, um, before we learn anything, which is the, uh, our informatic scientists, um, first they use the SUM, the self-organizing map algorithm to cluster the, these tensile compounds based on their structure similarity and uh, yield uh, 650 clusters, which is shown in this heat map. So each hexagon represents a cluster of the structurally similar compounds. So enriched clusters are shown in the red and the dark red colors. So among these 650 uh, clusters, we identified 76 clusters. Uh, they're significantly enriched with a compound that decreased the mitochondrial membrane potential, shown in this heat map um, in the red and dark red color. So we published this data in the EHP in 2015. I listed uh, the reference here if you, if you are interested. So after the primary screening, so we identified about 600 compounds that decreased the mitochondrial membrane potential. So in order to prioritize this compound for further study, uh, we use the tiered study approach. So we first tested these compounds in the mitochondrial membrane potential. At this time, we used the red hepatocytes and the hepatocytes 2 cells. And based on the compound potency, efficacy, uh, novelty, and the clusters information, and the um, commercial availability, we purchased the 34 compounds and tested them in the tier two assays. Um, I list here, there are much, much more uh, than you know, the tier one assays. So th those assays uh, include the, um, the cellular re respiration assays by measuring the oxygen consumptions and the compress one, two, uh, four inhibition. And we also test these compounds in the C elegant assays. So based on the data on the tier two assays, we identified about you know, a group of the 10 compounds there. We are pretty much sure they are the mitochondrial toxins and which um, are worth testing in vivo animal models in the future. So we also published this paper in the 2018 in the EHP um, journal. So from this um, study, we also found uh, some very interesting compounds. For example, like uh, chlorophenipil um, had a very similar uh, effect as the FCCP. So FCCP is a well-known compound, which is a um, mitochondria um, electron transporter uncoupler um, that you, know, you will see increase the oxygen consumption. However, the um, Pinocyano compound had a similar effect as the retinol shown in this figure. Uh, they inhibited the oxygen consumption rate by inhibit the, um, the complex one. So all the data we, you know, I also mentioned in the previous slides we published in 2018. I also listed the reference here. And so far we um, generated more than uh, 70 a million, million data points for the Toxin 1 program. And we uploaded all this data into our 
um, public database such as PubChem. So in order to use this data in 2014, we initiated the Tox21 challenge program and asked a cloud of the uh, research scientists around the world to use our data to build up the computational model that can better um, predict chemical toxicity. So this competition uh, attracted hundreds of the scientists from 18 different countries. The winners from this um, competition were invited to give a talk at the SOT in 2016. And also we published their um, paper at the Journal of the Frontiers in the Environment Science. So in order to better understand our data, because we produce tons of data. So in order to understand and also to encourage the computational scientists to use our data, so we, uh, we will host a continued education course at the SOT annual meeting next year, uh, 2021. So if you are interested, I encourage you to attend this meeting. Okay, so for the Talks 21 screening, um, we also face, you know, like the other projects, we also face a lot of challenges. So for example, many cell lines we use are lack xenobiotic metabolic capability. So we um, have limited the pathways coverage for our assays. And that we mainly rely on the engineered and immortalized cells. And we, can, we focus on the single compounds and we only test in a very short time. Um, and we also have limited the, um, the big data analysis tool. So in order um, to overcome this limitation of some of these limitations, so recently the Talks 21 leadership published a new strategic plan for fish direction. I listed uh, one uh, paper here, and also we have a review paper to talk about that one too. So, so for the future direction, so we will use the physiological relevant uh, cellular model. So these models are including uh, primary cells, stem cell, uh, derived cells, and 3D models. And we also try to incorporate the, the xenobiotic uh, metabolic capability into our assay system. So for example, we try to use the liver microsome uh, for our some of the assays, we try to incorporate them. And we will also bring in the new technology, the new platform, including high content imaging assay and 3D model into our screening system. So in summary, so the data from my presentation showed um, the various in vitro toxicological assay can be done in the, high, uh, in the quantitative high throughput screening protocol. And the uh, assay selection, assay optimization, and assay um, validation are very critical before we run the big screening. Of course, the follow-up study, uh, secondary assay are necessary after the primary screening. So finally, I would like to ac um, acknowledge the following people from my group at the NCATS, my colleagues from the NTP, EPA, and FDA for their contributions to this TOX21 screening program. So in the last two slides, I um, listed uh, some like the abbreviation that uh, we used in my talk and in this field and some references for your information. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Meng Hang, for a nice presentation. Um, I'm looking at the chat box. I don't see questions coming in yet. So if, you, if anyone has questions for Meng Hang, please, um, uh, uh, type your questions in the chat, and you can also utilize the Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask a question, meanwhile, Meng Hong. Um, I see you've run seahorse assays uh, for your compounds. I wonder whether you, uh, you ran any 3D uh, assays in a seahorse manner, and if, if that's possible, and what are the challenges to do so? Yeah, actually, the data I presented for Seahorse data, actually, it's our collaborator did. 
-hmm. So we have not tested, but even though we have the seahorse in the endicats, but my group have not done the seahorse um, the assay in house. Um, but I heard uh, you can run some three D in the seahorse, but I I'm not very sure. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's look at um, questions. I do not see any more questions coming in, Meng Hong. Um, uh, does any of the panelists have questions for Meng Hong? Well, there's no more, if there's no more questions coming, again, thank you very much, Meng Hong, for a wonderful presentation. Um,